famed author Clive Cussler. The hero Dirk Pitt. He was small, no more than two inches. He was going slowly but irrevocably mad. I think I'll take a look outside. My name is Pitt, Dirk Pitt. Raise the Titanic. Episode 1. Sheriff Dirk's Misogyny Roundup. I saw a guy riding near, in my neighborhood with a blue chef's hat on and an apron and very little else. So I think my country's <laughs> completely, based on that small and ant- all evidence, has gone completely bananas. That does sound fascinating, though. Or at least it's not boring. It's, it's not boring if you look at people because everyone is crazy. If you just look at them enough, you'll find the crazy. Everyone's got their own brand. It's it's all interesting. Everyone has interesting stories. That is true. I do love people watching. I do love letting people talk. Sure. They can go to an old age home and people are just willing to tell you secrets. That was something that it, they did on the CBC uh, years and years and years ago. And I only heard about it afterwards and heard about the finished result. But they essentially gave these audio recorders with hundreds of hours of space on them to homeless people and wanderers and travelers and transients and old folks' homes and just all sorts of marginalized groups and said, you know, talk, say whatever you want, hand it on to someone else, talk, say whatever you want. When it's full, pop it in the mailbox and it all went back to CBC and they made documentaries about it. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And I heard some of them on the radio and I kept meaning to like go and hunt the rest down because that that sounded like a fascinating project. That that reminds me of... Seven Up, which was a BBC uh, documentary series, they started in the fifties, oh, where they followed kids. Yes, all all the way to adulthood. Yes, I've heard of that one. Yes, it's unreal and bittersweet and sad and and brilliant. And I I keep meaning to go back because I've seen Seven Up, I've seen Twenty One Up. They and they always go back and they cover the in betweens when you have gaps. And I saw them when they were in their fifties, and it's just you know some. People have died. Some people no longer participate. But it's um, you see the twists and turns of people's lives and the snapshots every seven years. It's I, probably much like the project you just described. You're getting a very intimate view, mm-hmm. whether it's for a short period but intense, or like an old age home or a, a day in a life and a homeless person. I have to imagine every bit of being homeless is intense because it's got to be terrifying. And then the longer stretches of just everyday life maybe it would cause an existential crisis like what are we all doing this for we all just die anyway why are we spinning our wheels in a good way in a good way yeah. yep. a reassuring nihilistic outlook um a little down today my my best friend is moving to san francisco and she just uh she moved today no oh. it's sad but we have this wonderful book raise the titanic <laughs> oh my god Yes, I suppose we should get back on the script. For sure. Yeah, there is a few things I wanted to say about the book, or I I guess just ask your opinion before we dive into the nitty gritty. But I suppose I should start with, welcome to Cussler Hustlers, the only international Clive Cussler podcast. I'm your co-host, Topper. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy. Hello. (laughs) And we are starting season three, or whatever you want to call this. And this was the hit. This was the one that hit really big for Clive Cussler, raised the Titanic. This was the one that sold a million copies and got optioned for a movie. It ended up being a TV movie and made him a household name. And this was when it was he began punching out like a little bit faster than one book a year forever for the next 50 years. And good for him because boy, did he, he, he stumbled upon a formula and he was cranking him out. Yes, there are some definite moments that are the Clive Cussler formula. For one thing that I've noticed, I want to get your opinion on these two, the chapters are a lot shorter. Holy cow, the chapters are really, really brief. They, he's like a, a senior doing a book report on each chapter. Each chapter yeah. flies right by. After, like I think, an hour and ten minutes, I had gone through six chapters and the prologue. Okay, yeah, that's... Which is a lot faster than the other ones. Uh, we get the... 
historical prologue where you're just dumped in media res into some historical situation that sets up the modern plot, which I think happens in every other book. Because this book starts on the Titanic. Yes, this book starts on the Titanic, and there's uh, Clive is very uh, tuned into what people look like, and especially he loves pointing out short men that are not great. He must hate short people. <laughs> <laughs> we start with this short little guy who's uh, sweaty and nervous, and he's uh, woken up from his uh, stateroom on the Titanic, and he hears that the engines are off, and it unsettles him. R- reminded he's short multiple times. He's uh, apparently young, but he looks old. He looks like hell. And we establish that he's he has a key, and he's insane. Like, in the narration, the viewpoint narration, he establishes that he is insane. Yes. Like, oh, yeah. right, this is exciting. <laughs> he's calculated insane. I I gotta love a guy who knows where he's at. He's like, meet me where I am. I'm on, I'm on Team Crazy. Welcome aboard. <laughs> and he's fidgety and he's sweaty. He's maniacal. He's having bad dreams. He has cabin fever. He's messed up. Yeah, he's uh, that guy in The Shining. You know, Yeah. Jack is never a dull boy. He's, he's a, a, basically about to check into the Overlook Hotel. Very nervous man. But he realizes that, that there's something wrong. The boat he's on isn't moving. Dun, dun. Yes. What boat could it be? I hope to find out soon. We'll never know. Yeah. But th- this guy, um, do we do we find out his name in the, in the prelude? Because I we have. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. He says a name, and we meet the officer uh, who helps him out. Yes, this this. But we still don't get his name. A fidgety. This fidgety man pulls a gun on crewman Bigelow. Yes. Who I'm sure went on to found the fabulous tea company that makes uh, sleepy time tea. Yeah. <laughs> sleepy time. In constant comment. Love that one. Crewman Bigelow is held at gunpoint while the Titanic is sinking. I like this because I remembered when I was in Japan, fully suffering from sleep deprivation, wild out of my head, and I saw my first ever, it was in German, special about the um, ferry boat, the Estonia. Okay. It was a ferry, they left the doors open that you drive the cars on. Oh, right. Yes. But there was a guy who was recounting how he lived, but he was robbed at gunpoint while the ship was sinking of his watch. (laughs) And he was like, who does this? Apparently, psychic Clive Cussler. You see an opportunity, you take it. That's why I won't get a tattoo. What if I want a career of crime? You don't want identifying marks. Exactly. Don't close off the opportunities. I've seen all those shows. They're identified by by some tattoo that only they have in the entire world. Yeah, or jewelry that only fits them. Mm. And they're wearing it all times. It's why you always have to wear different size shoes. <laughs> Never lurk about in the same size shoes. So always, you know, have have a uh, falsies going behind you. Maybe some elven feet, clown <laughs> shoes, pointy boots, and no hobnails. So th- this uh, crewman Bigelow is being held up at gunpoint, and uh, yeah, sometimes that happens when a ship is sinking. People aren't at their best. Yeah, because this guy doesn't want off the boat. He doesn't want to be rescued. He has to get down to the uh, the storage hold right away. Yes, he goes down right away, and he does, with the help of Crewman Bigelow, get all the way down there. He takes out his key, he goes into the hold, and he's never seen again. Well, not just in the hold. In the hold, there is a safe. There's an eight-foot tall, wide, and long safe that he opens the safe, and then he, he shuts it on himself. He locks himself in the safe. Oh, so it's going to be like a magic act. Do you ever see uh <laughs> What? It's another movie I can't remember. Woody Harrelson was in it with the guy who was in Zombieland. They're all magicians, and it involves a safe. I don't recall they throw a it to Woody Harrelson and... magic movie. That wouldn't, that wouldn't, oh no, it's not Catch Me If You Can, it's... Now You See It. Now, yeah, because Now You See It, and the sequel was Now You Don't, which is just stupid. Oh, I love that. I love the stupid movie titles. <laughs> but the whole premise was revenge because a, sh- a safe trick went wrong. So maybe this is the long con mm. for the safe trick. An incredibly long con. Those magicians are very patient people. Thank God this boat's unsinkable, or this guy would be in real trouble. Yeah, I don't think they... I think unsinkable was... I've heard... It wasn't called unsinkable until after it sank. Then they were saying... Yeah. It was It was called incredibly safe at the time. Yes. But they weren't, like, just shouting it from the rooftops. This boat is unsinkable! You know, that, 
that that is marketing that is putting uh, too much on the line. I feel my mother had um, Titanic memorabilia from an aunt, Ooh. one of her aunts. Uh, she had a actual size light ring with the ropes. Neat. In the late eighties, nineteen eighty nine, maybe nineteen ninety, my dad was like, "We got to clean out this room, and we just threw everything away." Hopefully, that went on eBay. I, I it was pre eBay. No. Um, I'm hoping based on my family history, that it was just a replica that she got hoodwink hoodwinked into, uh, that we didn't throw away priceless artifacts. An actual piece I'm of hoping, the Titanic, yeah. I'm hoping it was just uh, some makeup ups that that looked convincing. <laughs> Otherwise, goddamn. <laughs> goddamn. Otherwise, it's I like, have regrets. <laughs> but now we go into Dirk Pitt's present day, chapter one. Chapter one, The Sicilian Project. There's like section names for this book too. I know. And I love this because this makes Clive, this cements Clive as a psychic. Because we open <laughs> uh -oh. up in the president who has broken every political taboo laid down before by every previous successful <laughs> candidate. Yes. <laughs> and I also wrote that down. He's a psychic womanizer. Who could have guessed it? And he is a street talker. Well, because he's a... He has a mustache, he's been divorced, and he's an atheist who smokes. He's a tough-talking straight shooter, and everyone loves him. Yes, he... And he was like the long-shot candidate, and he won, and, he, and he's on his second term. And just he's got so much hair. He's got a mustache. <laughs> he's Magnum P.I. president. Just when you think he's like the best president uh, there is, he's looking forward to his final term being over, so he can go retire and live on a beach and ogle, and I'm quoting this, Pug-nosed, balloon-chested native girls. Yes, I heard that right here. <laughs> pug -nose. That was like, whoa, what? pug nose. <laughs> First, pugs are adorable. They weren't. It's not their fault they were bred that way. That's entirely on the humans. But like, eh, eh. balloon-chested, I get. This still feels like all the racism is being couched in. I meant it in a complimentary way. Yeah, I said they had big boobs. <laughs> Clearly, they're great. Uh, Why would he go there and ogle pugnos? them if it was a bad thing? What, they're just butterfaces. <laughs> I just, uh, I just feel that wasn't as complimentary as he meant. That's not the you want an island. I don't even get the fantasizing. If you have a fantasy, why make the fantasy girls ugly? <laughs> well, I don't think they're ugly. I just think it's like pug nose. Call your wife pug nose right now and see what happens to you. She'll break your neck. <laughs> Well, That's yeah, a because she doesn't have a pug nose. <laughs> oh, okay. for accuracy is, is the point of contention here. <laughs> yes. Anyway, that was the, the great first uh, paragraph of the book proper. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then uh, uh, he's got like a hookerish girlfriend and they're going to host a party tonight. Oh, yes. But before that, uh, he's meted by, he's met, he's meted. Oof. <laughs> the current education. Before that, the president has his two favorite people slide into his office, Seagram yes. and Donner. And you never go to a party with a Donner. Because this is meta section, which is his super science skunk works that even the CIA doesn't know about, which I doubt that's true. But yeah. you know, like we're, right off the bat, we are getting into like a super spy sci-fi thriller vibe here. Because the two super secret scientists who work for the super secret meta section reporting directly to the president are looking for this mineral called byzanium so a bit of a plot being recycled from the last one byzanium yeah Byzanium. but i mean but all these Byzanium. Books, Byzanium. Byza Byzanium. it's a great name but all these books it's just the MacGuffin. it's uh, uh, america's looking for something oh. russia's looking for something a billionaire's looking for something and dirk has to beat them all to it sure it's the maltese falcon of of props. Yeah. That's how all these books go. That's how the Indiana Jones go. That's how the James Bonds go. So this one's already definitely got a bit more of a James Bond since there has been a lot of drinking and women so far and nothing's even happened yet. But that's accurate for the 80s. They're in the 80s, I understand there's a lot of cocaine, drinking. This and wasn't hair. the 80s. I think this was like 1976 still. He was ahead of his time. No, it was. It was written in 75, but it takes place in the 80s. Really? Is it futuristic? Yeah. He did it. He huh. went futuristic. I guess because in that case, he could just make up whatever he wants. And they'd yeah. be like, it's, the, it's in the future. He went ah. July 
1987. 87. Wow. That one line, I must, <laughs> I must oh, have yeah, missed. I would... <laughs> I, actually, I, I'm not even sure that was mentioned in the audiobook. I think the audiobook like skipped the date. Oh, well, that's cool. Oh, okay. I could see that because it's a chapter title. Yeah. Those aren't. My chapter title was The Sicilian Project. I could see how this. Anyway, these two scientists, these two scientists are looking for Byzantium, but they keep finding it in Russia. And they can't synthesize it, and they need eight ounces to test the project and 200 ounces to set up installations all along the American border. And that's kind of all the information we get on what the project is. I love this. It's very, um, of the time, uh, Oppenheimer's out, and I, know, under, I haven't seen it yet because I don't, I'm too old to sit for in a movie theater for three hours <laughs> yeah. for anything. <laughs> My daughter desperately wants to see it, and the movie theaters around here will not let you see a movie that is R-rated unless you're 18. Really? I don't know why they have such a stick. I have gone to them. I'll write a letter. I'll notarize. I'm a notary. I can notarize my own letter. <laughs> my son I'm, was 10, and I took him to see Predators years and years and years ago. And I can go with her. I can't just drop her off. Oh, well, that's no fun. I thought that, that was just like a hard rule, and I was pretty sure that was like a without, you know, without a parent or a guardian kind of thing. It's if it, it's without a parent or guardian, but I did this last year with the movie Halloween. I was begging them. I'm like, please don't make <laughs> me see this glorious <laughs> pile of shit. Please. I, I'll, it's not going to hurt her brain. I'll drop her off with her friend. I'll pick her up. The kids are safe. She won't see anything. It's a Halloween movie. Mm -hmm. It's really tame. Well, what you have to do is buy and your own like, ticket, no. go in, sit down, then just get up and leave. They know. They know. <laughs> yeah, they're really onto you. And, and for um, Oppenheimer, that seems like a very uh, it it's not showgirls. Some teen wants to sneak into Oppenheimer and watch historical drama. They're not doing it for uh to see boobies <laughs> or <laughs> or anything to get titillated. No, sorry. Let the, let the kids see Barton Fink. It's R rated, but they won't understand it. <laughs> ah, Simpsons. Come on, Bart. Sneak into an R-rated movie. Let's call Barton Fink. Barton Fink. Barton Fink. Barton Fink. Barton Fink. <laughs> but anyway, in the movie Oppenheimer, they're collecting uranium like a, a marble at a time. You see the marbles going into the jar. They need like a teaspoon here. They get mm -hmm. a, a scooch here, a pinch there, and they seem to be collecting this. Uh, Bazanium in that way. The chip straps. Bazanium. <laughs> so they have their issue with they keep finding Bazanium in Russia where they can't get it. And the scientists say that they have a plan, but we'll need Numa in order to sneak our science nerds into Russia. Having a Numa project in the area would be great, but they don't tell the president that they've already sent men into Russia and now they need Numa to get him out. Well, it's always easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And Exactly. They're the, the two guys, Seagram and Donner, are kind of keeping their guilt under wraps until tonight's party that the president will be having. And Seagram is there with his wife, who it is established earlier when we go into chapter two. Oh, let's go over Sid Copeland. Chapter two. Yes. Chapter two. We're in Russia. Sid Copeland is dying. Sid Copeland is stuck on a, a far cold Russian outpost, and he has been shot maybe twice. He's not sure. And I won't be either. Uh, fair enough. After you're shot once, your accountability is off the table. You are not accountable yeah. for anything. You get shot once, you don't have to count. I will be okay with you not being clear up on some on, on details. Answers for a little while. But this guy has gumption. He's on his own. We we hear him say to himself, he's a professor of mineral min min mineralology and not a spy and he's yeah. trying to psych himself up to bury himself his own body he's going to bury his own body in the snow this guy has gumption yeah because the the meta section scientists told him that he must never be found so he's preparing to just uh ah crap what was the union guy hoffa he's he's going to hoffa himself on this russian mountain and nobody will ever know he's there <laughs> and it's hoffa didn't hoffa himself so this is like extra heroics oh yeah we assume Hoffa didn't Hoffa himself. <laughs> but then he's found by a dog. <laughs> well, yes. And then he's found 
by a Russian. And then we're, we find Dirk Pitt, because the first thing Dirk Pitt does, shoot the dog. Yep. He swings into scene, dog is dead. Just like that famous and book, to establish a character that you have to like, shoot no away. That was save the cat. Shoot the dog is the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we get We're supposed to love him. Drops in right on the right as he drops the dog, Dirk is dropped in scene. But we get Dirk's standard introduction. And this is three books in a row now. This is three for three, where he has the oak tanned face and cruel features. And dancing green eyes. The the green eyes radiate warmth though. So he has cruel features. But cruel. Maybe that word was different I... in the seventies. But he's been described like our hero, the person we sympathize and empathize with and want to win, is cruel. Three books out of three. There was um a lot of emotional upheaval. That's manly as hell. That is so manly and I guess cruelty and manliness are forever intertwined in the nineteen eighties. Because they are. Yeah, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, you gotta slap some broads. <laughs> gotta yell at your wife. Shoot a right you that's not even a cry. Shoot any Russian you want. Yakov Smyrna, be <laughs> yeah, damned. Yeah. He's shooting a Russian soldier on Russian soil in the face. Like he just shot his dog because he got left to live for. <laughs> he shot him dead. Does it matter that it's in the face? It's all, it's all the overt acts of war that, that I'm more concerned with. It's, is it a crime if you don't get caught? No, which is the most... Yes, Topper. Yes, it's still a crime. <laughs> <laughs> that was I was going to say stupid. no, which is the most American thing ever about these books. <laughs> Both right. All of these things are legal if, if an American does it. God damn it. Wait, so Dirk drops in like a like a New York City cop, cop and with uh, with a dead dog on the lawn. <laughs> waiting to give you a ticket for the dead dog. Uh, Looking for a kid to flashbang? Oh, no. An infant. I said kid. It has, has to go to the bassinet. I wasn't going to go was, that far. This is it? a family podcast. <laughs> Do you know how much I had to bleep out of you talking about Nanke? <laughs> Last episode. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That's I brought it up, but you took it a little further. And I think the bleeps are funny. <laughs> bleeps are funny. Uh, anyway, Sid uh, passes out. <laughs> Sid passes out. He's been shot twice. Uh, he he sees Dirk rescue him, and then he passes out. And then we open in on chapter three with this guy Seagram. He's a physicist. He's waiting for his wife for lunch. This is the least Clive Cussler chapter to date. This yeah, so this chapter dropped in from a, a different, better book. Well, you think so? It's a brief chapter. It's it, it is very brief. Through. I have one paragraph, but th this is so far afield from everything else Clive Cussler has written that we've covered so far. Because this is just a scientist in a city having marriage difficulties. Yes, uh, it's drama. Although th there are there are a few lines I highlighted. And I would like your opinion on. <laughs> well, his wife is late. She's never on time. That's established. Uh, and she comes and she says, oh, my God, to her husband, you're dressed like an Omaha anvil salesman. <laughs> Whereas he says, uh, I've been waiting for 18 minutes. That's two minutes and 10 seconds longer than I usually wait. What does an Omaha anvil salesman look like other than fucking ripped? <laughs> Wouldn't you want to look like an anvil Actually, salesman? Actually, yeah. Now that you say it, Anvil, <laughs> Anvil Salesman sounds like uh, Al Giardino. It, is, it does. Why, thank you. I've been working out. I think she means it as argue. an insult, though. <laughs> yeah, she does. But there are, in terms of insults, that's a great insult in terms of a compliment. Mm -hmm. But she is not pleased with him. They're not pleased with each other. There's some strife. He wants her to just go along to get along. And she's like, we have to leave DC. You you keep working. It's destroying our marriage. It's all secret nonsense that you can't tell me anything about. And it's mm -hmm. the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And we can't. This is unsustainable. And he calls her a, a liberated female and a bleeding heart liberal. And liberal has, has now been used as an insult four times in this book. Yes. Bleeding heart liberal comes up. It's already twice because the president mentioned something about it before too. Yeah. Yeah, he mentioned something about what what do we do if some tight-fisted liberal in Congress asks about our little project? And the, the scientists are like, oh, it's fine. But he, his wife is like, everybody can be replaced. Your job's not that important. And yeah. he says, my gray matter 
was the sperm for this job. <laughs> Which... See, women just don't understand how important kids are to men. And by kids, I mean projects you create with your brain sperm. <laughs> Thanks for putting so that like, in my memory palace. But yeah, brain sperm. <laughs> she's a liber she's a liberated fe uh, liberated female who doesn't want kids, whereas he is obsessed with his project that he feels was is like his direct descendant. Yes, his gray matter was the sperm. This is somehow the most political Clive Cussler has ever been, and I'm not sure I like which side he's on. But maybe he's just playing devil's advocate and setting up the dynamic for these characters. And I had the note written down here that we are finally up to two-dimensional characters. Because the previous books have all been pretty well one-dimensional characters. But now we're up to two. Okay, well, this Dana Broad... This is progress. ...who's married to Mr. Seagram, the physicist, or Dr. Yes. Seagram, the physicist. Uh, she works for Admiral Sandecker, that is established right off the bat. I've heard of him. And then that chapter ends abruptly, and we're on chapter four. Yeah, she cries and leaves. And that goes without saying. <laughs> that's how... a woman in a class, it always ends a scene by crying and leaving. Every chapter with a woman. That's how the woman exits stage left. And we are we come across uh, in Russia, Captain Andre Prevlov. Yes. Who also looks like Magnum P.I. with a mustache. Yeah. Like a, a great bushy mustache. They establish how cool he is very quickly because he is handsome and fit. He has an Italian sports car. It's orange. His dad is high up in the party, and he drinks gin. And I just have the question, is this the Russian Dirk Pitt? <laughs> Look how and cool he is. He is very cool. He thinks like an American. He drinks like an, Eng like an Englishman, drives like an Italian, and lives like a Frenchman. Yes. One of my favorite authors, Bill Bryson, wrote a sentence about driving like an Italian. And he said he would drive like an Italian, too, if he drove hydrochloric acid on his lap. <laughs> uh, there has to be an easier way. Because when you talk to Italy, driving is a blood sport. It's, <laughs> and there's Vespas going, which, like most oh, of dear. the world, there's tiny roads. It wasn't built for cars. Yeah. At least their it, cars are smaller. Chaotic. I can't bring like an F-350 there. Their cars are smaller. Oh my God, no, you cannot. <laughs> that is an enormous vehicle. Yeah. An F-350. I drive one for work now and then. I hate that thing. Really? Yeah. Well, you and your family can get into it. At least you're tall enough. <laughs> Listeners, Topper's family is giant. They're all very tall people. They'll take over the world. Only most of us. He has enormous, strong, sh strapping children. <laughs> we will all bow down to the Topper family one day. <laughs> or no, we'll all look up to you. Because we have nothing else to do. Yeah. As the old joke goes... When Canada takes over the world, then you'll be sorry. <laughs> that's that's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Pavlov says he is the Russian Dirk Pitt. Wait, Dirk Pitt's swinging into this book. There's a 10 year gap from the last book. Do we assume he spent the last 10 years recovering from all the CTE and brain trauma because he was beaten to a pulp? I don't know. Because. Was he called Willisinger Walter Reed for a decade? Because now I'm wondering if the next book is going to come back to contemporary times. Like the next book is out in 1978 and will it take place in 1978? Is he going to have to keep reconciling what happens in this book going backwards in time? I don't know. I'm very confused. Maybe he thought, okay, I, I'm going to write one more book. And if this one doesn't sell, I'm just going to quit. And he poured everything into this book, maybe. And then it was huge. He's like, oh shit, I have to write 25 more. Well, I... He's pretty meticulous, and he is a writer, and he did pump out a bazillion of these books. Mm -hmm. We'll find out. You'll find out with us, folks. But if we're not reading an ad, that's not what we do here. We read these books years ago. We're not <laughs> refreshing until we get there. I've read them Captain years ago and out of order. It's all a jumble. Yes, and we're, we're coping with modern day life, so all of us are on chemicals of some sort. <laughs> Occasionally, Topper has a beer. I go to bad neighborhoods to pick up some black tar heroin before the podcast. Thank God. Every time. I'm sleepy, so I'm having a coffee beer. Oh, that I help. Yeah. So Captain Prevlov is reviewing the incident at Novaya Zemyov, the outdated military installation on a remote island in the north. Yes, and he's just received satellite photos of yes. uh, the new activity, and he's his interest is piqued. So he talks to his attractive secretary. You get a lot of 
perhaps unnecessary descriptions of the attractive secretary. And I have the- uh, She's also properly connected delivered. Yes, I have the attractive secretary count wrapped with one. I'm going to keep track in this book. Do you have an overall count too? <laughs> oh God, that's too many. <laughs> too many to keep track of. It's a spreadsheet. Remember, there was rooms full of them at, at the end of the last book. You'll just get um, Bill Gates going, this is not what Excel was meant for. <laughs> Wait, and we nosedive into chapter five real fast because the chapter oh, no. four is a page and a half. Then Dana, who at age 31 is looking wistfully into the mirror because she's noticing crow's feet have started. She's so old. What's happening? She's so old at 31, past 30, it's all. 31, my goodness. That's, uh, I mean, she's got months to live before she succumbs to old age. I know. And of course, Seagram helps by asking her, hey, when are you going to have a baby? A baby can save us, dear. But she refuses because she's liberal. Anybody listening to this, get the liberal bleeding heart. <laughs> she doesn't want a baby because <laughs> a baby doesn't save anything. That's what every troubled marriage needs. Let's, let's entertain this legally yours every second of every day bundle of of angst and tears that doesn't sleep where you want to that keeps you awake and deprives you of food and sleep yeah. that, that helps everything in the middle of this conversation about having a baby to save the marriage so they'll love each other he trashes her family going person by person by person as all useless criminals yes her her parents were alcoholic <laughs> deadbeats a weird diversion there buddy her her mom brought down brought home guys from the bar to earn extra cash on her back we presume and her older brother uh knocked over a liquor store and uh killed a guy so she put herself through school and she's come out on the other side as a professional archaeologist marine archaeologist i think yes a uh, marine archaeologist and now her husband is like baby me wife let's let's get you uh financially insecure again we can't have you like steady let's have some upheaval i mean you're so old this is our last chance <laughs> 31 but people did look a lot older back then yeah i thought that was just how all, how all the photographs looked people aged harder <laughs> you, you look at the actors the it the it's, it's the it was the fashion of the time but they also aged rougher maybe it was a lot of gas maybe it was all the union jobs that gave them time for vices yeah maybe our corporate overlords are right maybe if we just keep working it's healthier for us if you have time to join the beer league you'll be drinking the beer and uh, so you know we get this just odd chapter of this marriage yeah i had written down that i have a prediction based on how we keep getting viewpoint chapters from seagram's point of view and although he's a complete dick about it at every opportunity he does seem to love Dana. Like they drop in these very sweet sentences in between everything he actually says with his mouth out loud. So my prediction is, uh, where is it? They'll either reconcile at the very end or he has a heroic death. And then she realizes all along that he was a good man. Oh, we'll see how this goes. I haven't finished this book yet. She'll be pregnant and he'll die. <laughs> As I was saying it just now, I thought also she'll be pregnant. But then I thought, no, that's too silly. But then I thought, this is a Clive Cussler book. <laughs> <laughs> so I got five bucks on each of those, and you have ten on Baby. We'll see how we turn out here. <laughs> baby, and name the baby Dirk. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Call the kid Al, at the very least. Don't be mean. Dana Seagram is at the party, and she sees the president's uh, mistress? Not wife. Yes, we're in chapter six now. Ashley Fleming is wearing the same dress as her. Ashley Fleming, Washington's most elegant divorcee. And then one page later, they call her a hooker. <laughs> She's um, very catty fashion. As soon as the woman's out of your shot, the, Dana's like, that broad is a, is a hooker. Toots is a hoe. She, yeah. <laughs> She's over there with the same dress I'm wearing. I hate her. Yeah, Seagram asks her where she got it, and she says that she borrowed it from a model friend of hers. And Seagram says, you borrowed it from a lesbian? Oh, yes. What could that lesbian model know about fashion? <laughs> I don't think it was in a, like, that's a bad idea. It just seemed like a weird thing to bring up all of a sudden. Reminded me of my dad. Because if there was a lesbian anywhere, that's what he would have done. 
Oh, you went to borrow a cup of sugar from the lesbian across the street? <laughs> oh, the lesbian across the street died? Or are you going to a book club with a lesbian across? My dad would have done the same thing. <laughs> it's just old man 80s speak. <laughs> so they walk up to the president and the president just stares at Dana's boobs and propositions her. Or at he least whispers he, in her ear at least. He whispers in her ear for a long time. And then Ashley and Dana exchange witty banter, which is them just insulting each other. Worry. I graduated eighth grade from Catholic school. The priest stopped me on the stage and he whispered in my ear for like five minutes. But I was so nervous because I was on a stage and just a ball of eighth grade anxiety. I couldn't hear a word he said. Uh, just like, you know, tunnel vision. I, I was, I couldn't see, I didn't have peripheral vision. I was just totally panicked from being on a stage. So mm -hmm. all I heard was blood rushing in my ears. And everybody was like, what did the priest say to you for like five minutes? He was shaking your hand. And I still don't know. Hell if I know. That's always uncomfortable, sir. You're on a receiving line of anything, for anything. No extended conversations, or yeah. make them very mysterious. One way or the other. Lean hard. <laughs> this is the 1980s, or 1987. No such thing yet. It's the wrong kind of memorable. Yeah. It hasn't been coined yet. Anyway, we finally remember that we are in an action book, and one of the main characters shows up. We finally get Admiral James Sandecker. <laughs> he shows up? Well, all my pen clicking and paper shuffling, you're a doomed doomed man <laughs> and much like how dirk is described as he's always oak tan cruel features and green eyes we get sandecker who is a small man with red hair natalie dressed and i really like that word natalie it speaks to like an energy he's exuberant he's energy but also like really nitpicky arcing onto the scene it's fastidious he's fussy Fastidious. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. You know that he is always in full uniform and it's like absolutely perfect. Yes. And kind of like a ready to break out in a Yosemite Sam kind of activity at any moment. Mm -hmm. So he says hi to Dana. He says hi to Seagram. Out of nowhere, he brings up women's lib and says he's against it. Icebreaker? <laughs> what was Clive going through? And they want rights, huh? Crazy bro. <laughs> what was Clive going through in the mid 70s? Right. I, I shudder to think about it. Nothing. At every opportunity, the men just like stare directly at the camera and talk about liberal women. There's no way he could write this without knowing. He's got to be a feminist. Clive has to be a feminist because there's no way to write this without knowing it's bizarrely yeah. leveraged the other way. Yeah. Like it is he winking at the, at the reader? Is he just like talking about, you know, look at all these backwards men just so when we eventually meet Dirk Pitt, he's like, oh yeah, no, I like the liberal women. Yeah. I think it's uh, an all in the family trick. Like maybe, maybe that's just because they're more likely to sleep with them. That's the conundrum, right? You can't have <laughs> conservative women sleep with you. They're conservative. <laughs> so liberal women are there for a reason. They're conservative, but they're turned on by his raw animal magnetism. But they're also conservative, so they can be turned on. What, what good does it do you if they're going to wait for marriage and be nah, all non-liberated? I'm pretty sure Honestly, those romance books sell really well in conservative areas. <laughs> They'll get married in those books. Um, then let's see, chapter seven, they're mingling at the president's dinner party. And Seagram is rushed by his partner, Donner, who again, never invited Donner to a party. Uh, he rushes in and says to Seagram, Copeland's in the hospital. Seagram's like, fuck, we, oh, right. this isn't good news for us. Because they established that the first attempt was heading home, but it was radio silent and they couldn't get any answers out of it. Yes. And they had no idea. They were, this is all this conjecture as to why they didn't take one route and let the guy off to take a, a commercial airliner home. And now they know it's because Copeland's in the hospital and he's been perforated with a uh, lead poisoning at high calibers. Mm -hmm. All I can think about is the element. That's all that's on their mind. And they go, they leave the president's party to go to the hospital to do some extra doctoring for him. And unfortunately, that's where my notes uh, end for the night. Because I honestly thought it would take longer to get here. <laughs> but these yeah, are very short chapters. I, Holy crap. They're really short. The only thing I have is the next chapter, Prevlov has half a bottle of empty chartreuse to show how much of a, a bottle oh, of volunteers. God. Is chartreuse that is chartreuse oh my god i haven't had but chartreuse he's... in years and i remember that being a very blurry weekend well 
it's nightly to my recollection. Yeah, it's it's like, been decades. It's like Jaeger, but thick. <laughs> yes, the best way to describe it. <laughs> it's like a Klingon drink. It's got the 80, 80 herbs and spices, and half of them are toxic, but they're canceled out by the other half. Really? And like, it's really good, but also it is liquid hangover. It is, much like Jägermeister. I did Jäger once. I was with a friend. She was from Switzerland. So every time I went out with her, it was hardcore. Like the first time I went <laughs> out to dinner with a proper European, I brought a bottle of wine, and she was like, you brought one bottle of wine? What? Shorified. She was like, one per person. You're frozen, I think. Or you're very stoic. Uh, I don't know if you're still here. Oh, you're gone. Oh, you're back. Oh, you froze. I thought you were being very stoic. No, you froze. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> but she was great. Once I understood what I was dealing with in terms of like alcohol consumption, she got me onto her level. <laughs> and she took me to this place where they had Jägermeister that was served out of a skull. Ah, oh, nice. Uh, red eye light. It's a, it was this whole machine and... It, just, oh, okay. I don't remember. I, After the first shot, I don't remember anything else. <laughs> I like Jaeger. I'm like the only one of my friends who does. The taste? Yeah, it's not bad. It's horrendous. It's absolutely not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's like drinking closure. Well, that's just it. I'm apparently the only person I know who likes it because we were out at a rock show. Conaline Crush was playing back uh, down south where I used to live. And it was back in the days where it was Buck Pill. So it was like eight or ten ounce glass of Pilsner. For two bucks, they would drop a shot of Jaeger into it. Oh, okay. So Jaeger bomb. And fun fact, Jaeger in cheap Pilsner uh, will glow under black light. We're not sure why. It's it's horrible. Everybody was buying them for other people as dares. But I was just like, this is really good, actually. And just pounded them back. And It glows under black light? <laughs> just a little bit. When your canter glows under blacklight, at least you'll be able to trace it back to that memory. <laughs> Buck Pill was not good beer. I think they, it's beer that they found that like rolled off a train or something. That, I told you about when Customs uh, took all that Chinese beer that was illegal and then drank it, right? I think so. That happens. <laughs> every time, had beer poison headaches on the way back from a bus trip because they went, they had uh, evidence room beer. Woof. I guess that's one of the less dangerous things they can take out of the evidence room. No. That could have been... It was confiscated beer. It was very dumb. <laughs> yeah, but it could have been like heroin or fentanyl or something. It was pre, pre-fentanyl pre days. But yeah, it could have, ah. been, could have just been liquid heroin. So they were completely safe then. Oh, yeah. It, just, it could have been lead. Just liquid <laughs> lead. Mercury. <laughs> or just asbestos. It could have been a... It was seized for being dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, you only live once. Yeah, just just once. And then it ends abruptly sometimes. <laughs> okay, so that was episode one, season three is in the books. Yes, they haven't raised the Titanic yet. All we know about the Titanic is it may have hit an iceberg and possibly sunk. Yes, and shout out to my other famous history, historic shipwrecks that nobody talks about. Titanic gets all the glory. Yeah. There was the Wilhelm Gustav, 10,000 dead. Maybe more. Who was that? A cruise line? Nineteen forty-five. No, it was a refugee boat out of Germany. Nineteen forty-five. Dang. They know at least ten thousand people died, but they think it could have been double that because it was one of those situations. Just get on, everybody get on, yeah, get on for Oof. you know a chance to escape. So that one, pretty big one. Nobody knows about that one. Uh, I guess because everyone in their family <laughs> died. Say, well, that one's a bummer. The Titanic <laughs> was just long just long enough ago that it's awesome and there were still survivors so it's cool yours is just unmitigatingly sad we have this whole women and children too so yes it was <laughs> sorry sorry that was unmitigatingly sad you're right stop <laughs> laughing you are accurate and then empress of ireland uh more dead than, than, than the titanic titanic was uh 1496 empress of ireland two years later 1012 people dead and no one's heard of that one. No, no, that one's that one was uh, another sad one because women the corsets that and the skirts that women wore. Oh dear! They sunk. I'll drag you right down. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, I was listening to something about the woman who um, invented the swimsuit because swimming costumes for women hurt. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I think I've heard that story. That might have been a dollop episode. I mean, it might have been a dollop episode. I it, I didn't hear it on the dollop, but I was like, why did it? The past half, 
Why did the fashion for women have to be cumbersome and painful? Couldn't it, couldn't they have the who, hoop skirts I get? It's going to be a pain in the ass to walk into every room and you can't sit down. <laughs> they weren't spiked. It wasn't <laughs> an Iron Maiden hoop skirt. What, why does it have to be painful to be fashionable? I think stuff like that was really going through periods where women were seen as collectibles and the men had to make them as fancy as possible so they had the coolest collectible. Well, that's why the foot binding. Because they walk funny. Or they had to be super collectible t- to get picked by the men? I don't know. A little calm A, a little calm B. I feel like like they definitely went back and forth. I know there was angry outrage over women wearing pencil skirts in the 19... 19- well, that was the flappers. So that was like the 1920s. Like the men were angry about these like formless, shapeless skirts that 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 made the women look like boys. And the women were like, no, these rule actually. They're comfortable. You can dance in them. And you don't have to wear a corset. Yeah, because they're not wearing them for the guys. You can breathe. Imagine, you know, this fashion lets me take a full breath. Yeah. And, and, and go out, drink, dance, and party. <laughs> and the guys are furious. <laughs> and then I can buy another one for $5 because it's just a pencil dress. It's a tube. This rocks. Yeah, they also had paper dresses back then. Yeah. You can buy a paper dress for like a nickel and wear it for a day. And that was like, a, yeah, it was really neat. It was Fast just Fast fashion like, was a bit more environmentally conscious back then. Yeah. But men would got into the habit of um, spilling drinks on women wearing paper. The paper dresses, like they were oh, laminated, dear. but you still, gosh darn it, you just want a cute dress that's cheap for the evening, and some guy is like, oh, it's paper. Oh, it's ruined. You got to take it off. Yes, now. and to show that time is time is a funny thing. My history professor, my first history professor in college, was telling me when she went to a speakeasy that was still around because there weren't too many left. She went there during the Bay of Pigs invasion because she was worried about dying a virgin and she wanted to go get a drink, and she met her mother at the speakeasy. Because <laughs> her mom, unbeknownst to her, had been going to this bar since it was a speakeasy in the twenties, and they just never talked about it. Hi, <laughs> mom. I'll be over here. <laughs> Mom's like, you didn't see me, and I was like, that's a cool mom. <laughs> this never happened. And I'm like, oh, parenting from the past sounds great. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you with that. Good night. Let's download this stuff. Good night, dear listener. This has been Custler Hustlers. Your hosts have been Topper and Nancy. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Custler Hustlers.